Hello YouTube and welcome to today's navigation special episode. Our student pilot today is on a navigation test flight where he puts together some of the key skills that he's learned throughout the PPL syllabus. This flight is split into four sections and will be conducted in the same manner as a PPL skills test. That means beforehand he's given a copy of the standards document 19. This is a document that the CAA produce which outlines the scope and the required expectations of the PPL skills test. The document sets out the permitted deviation that you're allowed or errors at various stages of the flight in terms of height, speed or indeed heading. It also has um, some really good guidance on the format of the test but also what the examiner is looking for pre-flight. So for example the mated brief. The mated brief is a good tool to use and should be done before any flight regardless of a test or otherwise. So first of all M stands for meteorology. So what is the weather at the departure location and the destination location and what is the weather likely to be in between? So we've got a couple of tools for this where you can use the uh, meter, the current conditions, the TAF, the forecasted conditions and also we can look at some of the charts. So in the UK the Met Office pre prepares Form 215, which is the synoptic low-level um, chart of the UK, and you can see what different fronts um, are, are coming through in the relevant time period, and also what is the expected conditions in the sectors um, behind those fronts. We've also got two, Form 214, which tells us what the upper air winds are, really, really critical, as we'll find out later on in the video as we go through the different types of uh, navigation. So A, um, this stands for aircraft and it really covers um, the documents, the maintenance schedules, the insurance, weight and balance, if an A check's been done and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail in another video but it's basically making sure that the aircraft is fit to fly. Um, next one, T, traffic. Uh, so what radio frequencies are expecting T's during the day, what uh, areas of controlled airspace we're going to go through, who do we need to talk to, is there any listening squawks or transponder mandatory zones that we need to be aware of. Also, no TAMs, notices to airmen, so what is going on that may impact our flight. Today we know we've got a couple of air shows going on, for example, um, just to the north of our route. So the no TAMs are really important. You can get this information um, via the old school method, shall we say, um, via the NAT AIP website, or indeed uh, some of the newer um, graphical uh, interpretations available through SkyDemon Line, for example. The next one, exercise. Well, what are the GCCs for the flight? And this is a great opportunity to review the flight log, and we'll come on to that one a little bit um, more detail in a second. And then finally, uh, duties. So who's doing what in the flight? It's a great chance for you to do a safety briefing with passengers if they haven't flown before or with an examiner you can please when I ask you can you pass me the map or don't press any buttons for example. So back to the flight. First of all the, uh, the student has been given a destination and he has to navigate via dead reckoning. He then has to find a small farm using the OS map and then we move on to the track crawl section using a 1 to 250,000 chart. And this is where features on the ground are identified on the map and then you're navigating going from ground feature to ground feature. Finally, there's a diversion, um, assuming that the airfield is no longer available due to weather or other reasons. Uh, in truth, there's actually another section as well, radio navigation, um, but in the aircraft that we're flying today, we don't have a VOR, so we're gonna have to skip this today. We can't test it. The first leg on this navigation exercise involves dead reckoning, otherwise known as classical navigation or deduced reckoning. So what it entails, looking at a map and establishing where you are, point A, going to a destination, point B. You look at uh, and measure what the distance is from point A to point B and measure on the, the chart what the true track would be or what, what is the direction you need to fly to get to that location. Then you use the formula speed equals distance over time. And then you can do a little bit of math to say, if I'm flying at a certain speed over a certain distance, it's gonna take me a certain amount of time to get there. As long as you accurately fly the heading, the speed, and the altitude that you've done these maths calculations at, then you will arrive at the destination after the elapsed period of time. 
However, we have to add in the effects of the wind. So we use a wind triangle. Now this can be done using a whiz wheel, an E6B flight computer or a CRP1, or indeed just using a bit of basic math. But try to visualize it this way. If you're flying north and the wind is coming from the west, then the wind is gonna blow you off slightly to the east. Using the whiz wheel, the, the, the flight computer, you can calculate what that drift would be in terms of degrees. And then you can establish what sort of wind correction angle, so in the example we just used, if we're being blown to the east, then we need to put a wind correction off to the, the west to end up at the same point to, to correct for the wind. We can also use the flight computer to calculate the effects of any headwind or tailwind. So, for example, if we were flying 100 nautical miles distance from point A to point B, and we were flying at 100 knots, which is nautical miles per hour, then the time between location A and location B would be one hour. Now, let's do the maths if we had a headwind and tailwind. Let's call the numbers where we're going to face a 20 knot headwind. So, the same distance, 100 nautical miles, but this time we're only going at 80 knots. So in this case, we're now, we can do the maths with 100 nautical miles divided by 80. That's going to end up with 1.25 or um, in minutes, hours and minutes, that's one hour and 15 minutes. So that 20 knot headwind has now added an extra 15 minutes onto the duration from point A and point B. Now let's change it around. Let's use a tailwind scenario. So we're getting 100 knots, but with a the tailwind, our ground speed is now 120 knots. Now we're still doing the same 100 mile distance, but this time it's divided by 120. That equates to 0.83 of an hour, or in, in minutes, that's 50 minutes. So we now made ourselves a saving of, uh, of 10 minutes. The next part of the navigation exercise is track crawl. Now, the student has correctly identified Puckridge, the town of Puckridge, um, which was the end point of the dead reckoning leg. He's then swapped over to an OS chart. In this case, he's been given OS chart number 166 and been given an OS grid coordinate to go and find a farm. Now, typically when we navigate, the higher you are, the further you can see, and it's easier to navigate by large landmarks. But when using an OS chart, because there's so much detail on the chart and the scale is substantially different, then it's actually a lot easier to slow the aircraft down, descend to a lower altitude whilst obviously still remaining safe. So the OS or Ordnance Survey map that we're using for this flight, one to 50,000, is substantially different to the one to 250,000 chart that we usually use when we're navigating. And with this scale change, comes with additional details that we wouldn't usually see. So, for example, some of the features identified on the map are cuttings, embankments, um, churches with and without a spire, for example, um, and windmills or types of wood, all of which can be really useful when trying to navigate and identify a specific farm. Now, unfortunately, owing to the battery dying on the camera, we've missed the end of the track call back towards the Brookmans Park VOR. So here we are on final approach to Denham's runway 06. We're lined up just to the north of the runway, the north side grass. Hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, as ever, if you've got any questions about uh, navigating, then please leave them in the comment section below. We have done a very, very quick whistle stop overview. There have been a huge uh, number of simplifications uh, made. So um, this is just scratching the surface of how pilots navigate. Stand by for further videos on the subject. Now, just a quick reminder, this video is just here as a training aid and it absolutely does not take the place of a full certified flight instructor or a lesson. So make sure that you get formal instruction from a flight school.